Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in tonight for Richard French and we begin once again with the church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina and suspect Dylan Roof who made his first court appearance today and he also came face to face with the family members of some of his victims. From the county jail where he's being held in isolation, Dylan Roof appearing on video before a judge yes, sir. charged with nine counts of murder. One for each of the lives police say he took during the Bible study he joined Wednesday at this historic black church. We welcome you Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know. Every fiber in my body hurts and, and I'll never be the same. One of the survivors looking right at the 21 year old police say killed her son. Yet she and others who lost family members in the massacre sticking with the very messages the victims studied that horrific night. God forgive you and I forgive you. Forgiveness for a man friends say was a racist who plotted this attack for six months. But instead of starting a race war as friends claim was his goal. This community is united mourning today hand in hand. And several hours after the shooting, here's what President Obama said. Once again, innocent people were killed in part because someone who wanted to inflict harm had no trouble getting their hands on a gun. It is in our power to do something about it. I say that recognizing the politics in this town uh, foreclose a lot of those avenues right now. The president obviously suggesting we need better gun control, expanding on that in comments to the mayor's conference in San Francisco today, saying at some point as a country we have to reckon with what happens. It is not good enough to just show sympathy. And adding every country has mentally ill people, but not every country is awash with easily accessible guns. Guns, one of the topics related to the massacre that we'd like to talk about tonight. For that, we're joined by our panel. Darren Porcher is back with us. He is a retired NYPD lieutenant. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Dominic Carter is here, political journalist and author, as is Noam Bramson, the Democratic mayor of New Rochelle and the 2013 Democratic, Democratic nominee for Westchester County Executive. And, and nobody seems to think that we're going to have the political will to actually do anything about gun control. Is there... Is there any takeaway from what the president said and what, as a former police officer, what do you take away from the, what the president said and the, the calls for greater action on guns? Well, I think gun control is something that's necessary. When we look at a state like South Carolina, uh, the Second Amendment holds strong and true there. However, they need to understand that the overriding concern is public safety, and that's been defeated here. Uh, when we look at a state like South Carolina, for example, um, this individual, Mr. Roof, he, this was a lawful purchase because he didn't, although he was arrested for a felony in the past, he was not convicted of a felony. Therefore, he was lawfully in possession of this firearm. And we have to look at what are those steps in place that prevent these things from happening in the future. Uh, the arrest, I understand, arrest may not, it does not equate to a conviction. However, this, is, this, this um, begs the question for an adjustment phase. His roommate at one point was so concerned about his state of mind that he said he took, his, he took Roof's gun away from him, only to give and it, gave back, it back to him. Uh, right. Only get to give it back at some point. Should there be some sort of threshold under which people who are close to a gun owner say if, if you're concerned that you have to report it is that a step that's remotely feasible i think that that's a step but that's only one cog in the mechanism of change as we look towards gun control um, when we look at a lot of this here in the united states we have more shootings by acts of gun violence than any other country in the world so we have to look at how can we retool our focus on gun control to make this a safer society. I think as a start, I mean, we're having these conversations one too many. When we look at uh, what happened in, whether we look at Columbine, mm -hmm. we look at Aurora, Colorado, uh, et cetera, this is an ongoing process and a change needs to start. And we also, in addition to having more gun incidents and more shootings, we have more guns and we have a couple of uh, maps to show people at home that show just how many more guns the United States seems to possess. And, and there it is. We, we, per capita, the U.S. far and away leads the world. 88 guns per every 100 person in the country. But the, the difficulty in this, Mr. Mayor, is I think we can all safely say that if any of us had been in that church, we probably would want to have a gun to be able to, to fight back against somebody who's 
clearly, you know, lost his mind and, and is uh, intent on inflicting harm and killing people the way this gunman did. Well, I can understand that as an instinct, but the evidence shows, and I think Darren would be able to verify this, that the more guns you have, the less safe you are. And the answer to gun violence is not to put more guns in more hands with fewer restrictions. It, uh, that simply results in greater incidence of uh, death and crime. Uh, but unfortunately, the president was making, I think, a, a sad statement of, uh, of reality. Uh, I don't know that there's another issue on which you have a better example of a comparatively small but highly motivated and well-funded interest group consistently running roughshod over the great majority of Americans who do favor common sense gun safety standards that would enable law-abiding people to have their firearms but would keep guns out of the hands of those who are mentally ill or have a criminal record. And the combination we saw here of violent racist hatred and access to guns is an awful one that has just ripped the heart out of a community. I, I almost feel idiotic even asking this question because it comes up after every single mass shooting that we have, but is there any political will? Clearly there's not any, even the president doesn't seem to have the political will to at least push Congress for gun control anymore. Well, I think that depends on how you define political will. I think the president himself and many members of Congress are personally willing to stand up and clearly affirm their support for gun safety. But they're recognizing that there's a certain composition of the Congress, and there's no point in fighting a battle that's going to be a sure loss. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, if you want to engage in the hollow gesture of putting a piece of legislation forward, it's one thing. But until there's a change in the Congress itself, or until people who are supporters of gun safety start voting on that basis, uh, we're going to be stuck with a national government that is simply incapable of addressing this. But, Dominic, even if we wind up doing that, odds are against, you would think, significant gun legislation. It's not going to happen. It, it, we have to look at the political reality on the wall, Andrew. And I agree with the statements that have been made by both of my colleagues, but what the mayor just said, as far as the president making a sad statement on reality, I believe is exactly what you said, but he also did something else. Uh, it was a boomerang effect. Nine people are not even in the ground yet. And supporters of the Second Amendment are already in unison rallying against the president's comments. Think about this for a second. Let's stop for a second and think about this. 24 hours after these people have been murdered, assassinated, there are those that support the Second Amendment. And many of us feel that, you know, you, sh you should have a right to bear arms, but there has to be restrictions on everything. And there are people that, on, that are, are part of the NRA that are saying, as a matter of fact, let me quote the one man that blamed the pastor. He blamed the pastor that's not even dead yet. He blamed the pastor and said, well, you know, if he wasn't anti-gun, maybe if somebody had a gun, then they would, they would be a lot. That is ridiculous. The mayor's right on that account as well. More weapons is only going to lead to a, a Wild West shoot them out. And, you know, it's not, people think it's easy, and law enforcement can confirm this, to shoot someone. It's not. That's one thing when the police department had me go to the academy, that's why they, they don't shoot aim, and you can correct this if I'm right or wrong. They don't aim for arms because you can miss and hit someone else. Center they, mass. Center mass. That's what they aim for. And so that's for a law enforcement professional. Now imagine nine people in Bible study, in Bible study, and they all have guns. Think about it for a second. And Darren, there's, there's no possible way to police ourselves to gun safety, is there? That's a very difficult endeavor. Um, gun safety is something that occurs with education. Gun owners must be educated in the proper components of gun safety, such as gun locks, et cetera. Uh, a lot of this, we also look back at this individual. There's not a lot of information out there in terms of this individual. Uh, he had uh, a very small circle of friends. His uh, social media connections were, were run over, and it was deemed that this was somewhat of a loner. And so at this point, he appears to be someone that acted alone. And it's, a difficult, it's difficult to say, how could we have prevented this from happening? If we look at where the tips came from, his father and his uncle 
were the first people to make that phone call, the state that, look, I believe that this is my son. So it's really, and those are the people that are closest to him. He had another friend, once again, like you mentioned, that hid the firearm mm -hmm. and later gave it back to him because the friend thought that this was a hoax. This guy wasn't serious about it. At what point do we take these things serious? And at what level of education do we ensure that gun owners have when they maintain guns in our society? A couple of other points connected to the shooting that I, that I wanted to get to. The first is that there's been some conversation as to whether we should call this an act of terrorism. And, and if, you, if you look at the dictionary definition or even the legal definition of domestic terrorism, it seems to fit. Now, I'm not sure there's much value in, in whether you call it terrorism or not, except that when there's a terrorist attack, we tend to look at causes of it and how we can prevent it from, from happening in the future. And to me, that goes back to guns. It's interesting. The mayor and myself, we had a conversation over this prior to coming on the set. Generally speaking, there, is, uh, there, there are numerous definitions for what terrorism is. However, the key, point, the key focus is an act committed uh, towards a population to cause the population fear. This was an act that was targeted towards a particular group, which were African Americans. And was interestingly enough, South Carolina is one of five states that doesn't have a hate club doesn't have hate, cli hate crimes provisions. However, when you look at the punitive measures that are in play in South Carolina, they can go, they go, they're far reaching in terms of the consequences. South Carolina, remember, is a death penalty state. So going back to, is this a, is this a, a terrorist act? I beg to differ. I don't see it as a, I don't see it as a terrorist act. I see it as a hate crime. Although South Carolina does not hate, have hate crime mm -hmm. provisions, the federal government does, and they can easily step in and prosecute this case. Anybody disagree? Anybody think that it is terrorism, or, or it should be called terrorism, or is it just a distinction without a difference? I don't know that it matters what label you apply to it, frankly. And I, I think uh, the the distinction that was just drawn is is a sensible one. Uh, the lessons to be learned from this uh, are unrelated to whether you slap the terrorism label on it or not. It's about racism, it's about access to firearms, and it's about the violent impulses of a deranged individual. And, and when you put those things together, you get an incident like this. Let me just make one point, though. I think sometimes we have a tendency, understandably, to react to single dramatic events like this. We can all understand why. It's, it's human nature to do so. But the real nature of the gun problem is most evident when we step back and look at the statistics that cover the whole country. I mean, you put up that chart earlier about mm -hmm. the number of yes. guns. If you put up a, another chart which shows the incidence of gun violence, the incidence of gun deaths, we are far ahead of the rest of the world. I mean, it is an epidemic of gun violence. And so while you can never be sure whether the proper law would have prevented this particular incident or that particular incident, you can say that across the board, it would reduce the likelihood of any particular incident, and that would save a ton of lives. Andrew, I, I don't understand, and I know it's not you, it's the national media and some folks and stuff. What's the difference in, in whatever we call this? I, I think mean, it, I, to me, it's, per, it's how it's perceived and how okay, people react but, to it. But, but I look at it from the families of one of the loved ones. Do you think that they're sitting down right now referring to this as an act of domestic terrorism? Or do you think that they're in terrible pain for their loved ones? I think it's the latter. And I think that, I mean, it, it's remarkable to me. If we want to talk about labels, let's talk about the labels of forgiveness that several of those family members were able to sit in that courtroom remarkable. and look at the video, because I couldn't have done it, yeah, and say, I forgive I you. Yeah. I couldn't have done it. There's one more point that I, that I want to get to in, in all of this, and that when we, we talk about stop and frisk and we talk about issues of, of significance within the black community, and Dominic, you'll frequently say the, that the black community, the, the black American needs to have a reckoning when it comes to the family structure and raising kids and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Racism is not a natural phenomenon. Racism is taught. And I don't, there's, there doesn't seem to be any call for conversations within white racist communities and white racist households in a similar fashion. There doesn't seem to be a similar level of responsibility in, in the, that's equivalent to the calls that you make within the black community for white racism. And, and I just, I'm curious your, your reaction to that. Well, as you're asking the question, all I could think about are the people in South Carolina that, that were killed. A head librarian, a woman that, that is old enough to be in retirement, uh, the 
pastor and the state senator, the student that just graduated from college, the third one there, uh, holding the phone, I believe, a young man with his hat to the side. These were pillars in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. When I go on my rants about what's going on in the black community, these are not the people that I'm talking about. These are the people that we're looking at that are very strong in the black community. As far as racism from the white community, I mean, there are some that will tell you racism is, is as str strong or as common as apple pie. I mean, I tend to hope that that's not the case. And I think that we're dealing with a deranged individual. Absolutely. You know, and so this is an exception because there's no other way to put it. We're dealing with a nut job here that, that did not have much of a life. And now he goes down as a martyr. That's the, that's the thing that I hate, that no matter what we say, he achieved his goal. But it's not just a nut job, nut job fueled by hatred. I'll give you the last word on this. One point uh, that we need to mention was, granted, this was an individual that had a goal of creating a civil war between African Americans mm -hmm. and Caucasians. Mm -hmm. The person that made the phone call was his father, which was Caucasian. In addition to that, it was his uncle who was Caucasian. The individuals that made the second call to police, there was a female that spotted the car based on the description she was a Caucasian female. So it's clear to state that Caucasian people on many levels definitely condemn this act. Mm -hmm. And we see this, as Dominic mentioned, as a lunatic that was on the loose. We'll leave it there. We'll take a break. More RFL right after this.